Hello. In this episode of Airs for Architecture, I speak with Paul de Prazczyk about his recent book, Animal Architecture, published by Reaction Books in March 2023. Airs for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of Airs for Architecture. I'm talking today to Paul Debraschik. So Paul is appearing on the podcast for the second time, um, and this time with another book, Animal Architecture, Beasts Building and Us. Uh, published by Reaction Books. And it's a, it's an interesting book because the last time I spoke to you, you were talking about anarchism and architecture, architecture and anarchism, which you had published previously. And that was more uh, a, a wonderful book uh, and a lovely encyclopedia of, of various kinds of projects that manifest aspects of anarchist uh, practice, anarchist thinking. This one is a different animal altogether. Um, uh, much more, I suppose, feels to me, and maybe you can put me right here, um, feels to me much more like a passion project, perhaps, perhaps something that emerges from your own thinking more coherently. And it's certainly a more academically kind of rigorous book, but perhaps you can question that. I don't know. Where did it come from and why did you decide this book? Well, it, I, I think it's interesting because it is. it does, it did come out of the anarchism project. Mm-hmm. Um, it's important to remember that, that that project was a commission project. Mm-hmm. I've, I, although it's it, it was something that I was very interested in, and and it was a very intense period of research, and involved lots of visiting lots of sites and um, being very challenged personally in terms of my own kind of ideas about architecture and activism. Um, it was a commission project, so I was very much kind of felt that I was. Um, developing the, the book as a as a kind of response to someone else's desires mm-hmm. and yet this project was a kind of um definitely came from my own interests but it was linked in that um probably probably need to draw, draw you back to a, a visit that i made to, to the lamas eco village which is also you know i've included in the introduction to, to the animal book as a really key moment so that was in 2019 um where it's just a weekend, but a very intense kind of weekend where I was thinking about lots of different things. And one of the things, the, the guest house that I stayed in, which was a sort of chalet type building, um, you know, one morning I noticed that a, a, a wasp, a queen wasp was just starting to build um, a nest on the roof of the um, the greenhouse part of the the chalet. And I remember it very clearly, just how I felt, the, the, the feeling of unease, the feeling of kind of extreme discomfort at the thought of this animal um, occupying the same space as me and worried about it. <laughs> And I think that stuck with me as a kind of um, sort of starting point for this project. But also, you know, uh, it, in, in an eco village, there is a much more kind of uh, what I call a porous relationship between buildings and what's outside, mm-hmm. whether that's plants or, or animals. And that's very deliberate. That's part of the, 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 the ethos of an eco village. But it struck me as an interesting subject in its own right. And I think that's what led me into this project. Um, I've also been for many, many years interested in broader issues of ecology. And I think I wanted to channel that in, in in a more specific way into a project related to architecture. Uh, and then, of course, we come to COVID. And I think, you know, the, the very beginning of COVID, I was still completing the work on anarchism. And it was slightly curtailed because of COVID that um, I actually finished it more quickly because I didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> so it was like a, a sense of it came together a little bit more quickly. I couldn't really do many of the site visits, the remaining site visits I'd planned. Um, So there was a a, a window of opportunity during COVID. And as I'm sure you know, and and many of us experienced this, suddenly there was a kind of um, foregrounding of animals and nature within our lives, wherever we were, I think in cities as much as in, in the countryside. And particularly in cities, actually, where um, we we started to notice animals in a way which I think we hadn't 
done before, partly our own situations of, um, you know, sensory deprivation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or social deprivation, but partly because the animals were responding to, to our being inside. So they were coming out. And I think there's a sort of sense in which I suddenly thought, oh, gosh, this is a very interesting reciprocal thing going on here between animals and people, which suggests that it's happening all the time, right? It's happening all the time, but we, we're not noticing it because um, we only notice things when things change very dramatically, as mm. they did, particularly in the first lockdown, I think, uh, the COVID lockdown. So I guess a few things kind of came together to open up the the, the sort of ideas of this book. Um, yeah, I mean, you touch on this idea of COVID, and this is something that I would noticed, in, um, and I put it in my notes to you yesterday, the, the um, Albania Neva's book, Architecture After, After COVID, yeah. where she starts off with this idea of this transgression of this boundary by this unseen natural thing, this thing of nature, um, although its origins might not be natural. But anyway, leave that aside, push that to one side, this idea that we coexist in the world um, with things that we have become very accustomed to excluding. And to a certain extent, as you, you were saying, just they're unseeing, like it's not just that they don't exist in the contemporary world, it's that we don't see them even when they do. Yeah. I mean, you've got those strange photographs during that period of like deer in on dual carriageways in town centres and things like that. And it was like people were suddenly observing a reality that was actually already there. They were, but it was it also, you know, I also found it interesting that it also it fed into an imaginary that that, that we have, so a post-apocalyptic imaginary that we 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 sort of has been uh, has been sort of inculcated into us. Mm. We were seeing these things also through that lens as well, which I found really interesting. Yeah, I hadn't hadn't thought of that as well. Of course, that's a kind of that's a trope from the movies, isn't it? As soon as like uh, it, it is, but it's also I think reflects a certain kind of um, what I might use the word redemptive potential of. Um, that particular sort of imagination where nature reclaims so the idea of nature kind of coming back in undoing the harm that we've done which is often present in that particular kind of imagination i worked on this many years ago about, about ruins and the imagination mm -hmm. um, so it's it interesting to sort of tie that up a little bit with with covid for sure i wonder if you might want to talk about so the book is cut into into seven sections uh, five chapters an intro and what you call a coda at the end i mean yeah. maybe it would be nice to kind of better understand the trajectory of the narrative arc of the book the the way that you've kind of structured it um yeah i mean the introduction is 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 quite i i just reread this this morning actually um and i was surprised by the sort of po polemic of it <laughs> it's, it's pretty strident and i'm not sure i'd write that again uh, which is is interesting, but it's 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 kind of taking architecture to task, really, yeah, as a, as a destructive um, force in the world rather than a, a, a less, you know a productive or creative force. Yeah, that that was the central argument for that. But the the chapters themselves are really what I would say is dividing by sort of animal type, right? So mm -hmm. it's it's. It's difficult when structuring a book like this to, to say, well, which animals am I going to choose? And which mm. so I'm, it's, it's 30 different animals, basically, that I chose. So it's structured by the animal type or what we would call species, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's family or... Um, but it, 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 in a way, it's about how do we see animals in, in the round and how do we go beyond, um, I, I would say, conventional ideas of... The relationship between buildings and animals which tends to be i guess either pets so dogs and cats particularly or or livestock or zoos so animal buildings built for animals so i was quite interested in the sense of animals themselves having a kind of agency within buildings whether that means 
uh, more literally animals building for themselves, things like wasps, bees, beavers. Um, Bermites is a good one you use as well. Bermites, yeah. And uh, rats. And, 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 yeah, rats. And, you know, even things like excavation of holes is a kind of building, right? It's a very mm -hmm. primitive kind of building, but mm -hmm. it is nevertheless accounts in, in my... so that kind of notion of animals as agents but also how they get into buildings how they use buildings without our it, without our consent right? or without our so i find it really interesting thing like a, a wasp nest built on a building right which is not so much a, an issue in in the uk although people, they build them inside lofts and spaces that are kind of um humans don't use particularly mm -hmm. uh, but certainly in more tropical countries wasps will often build right on buildings or on mm -hmm. eaves outside and this kind of interested me is that what if we were to think of this uh, as a kind of extension of the building right like like a conventional human built extension but one built by other creatures uh, rather than this thing that has to be removed right mm -hmm. so it's like it, to me it, it it's this strange sense of that there are certain kind of animal structures things like wasps that uh, that are the only thing you you find out about them is how to remove them how to kill them mm. which i thought <laughs> this this is this kind of really needs to be questioned right you know yeah. it's, it's an interesting conundrum that we we are very selective about which animals we embrace and which we reject very violently i would say yeah uh yeah for sure. i mean it's a really that, that's a very interesting that's a very interesting concept but but one of the things i was interested in is this <coughs> there's a tone in the book perhaps there's a tone in this form of literature and, and perhaps you can talk about other literature that's inspired it i mean Maybe that's a good place to start. Like, where does this? Where where is the where is the kind of historiography of this kind of thinking? Where who has written about this before? Where where I mean, or is this a is this a totally new turn? Because I've noticed it a lot in academic conversations and conferences where people are starting to talk about interspecies uh, mm. symbiosis much more, um, and starting to talk about the the um the privileging of the of the human as um inherently problematic and also f fundamentally unrealistic and i think this comes back to your point about the wasps nest on the building is that if a human builds a building animals are going to live in it and it's just about how we relate to that cohabitation either we go around killing everything all the time um or we learn to sort of balance it a little bit better. But I was wondering, yeah, is there a kind of is there a kind of lineage to this thinking, or is this a very specifically contemporary concern? Um, I think there is a lineage to it. I think the the issue for me is that this, you know, what I would call a, a very widespread. Um, necessarily call it post-humanism although that probably fits that's the best overarching term that fits a, 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 a big range of approaches mm -hmm. to this idea that we need to decenter humans mm -hmm. of the world it's happening just at the time that humans are the most dominant that they have ever been and 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 i think this is a really interesting kind of um tension mm -hmm. it's emerging in ideas of the post-human that, that it, it it's it seems to be dependent on or it comes out of a sort of privileged position that we are dominant we have kind of um created a society where we can pretty much escape nature right and we can we can live without kind of having to till the ground having to think about pests and pest control well mm -hmm. some people have to think about that but most of us don't mm -hmm. and therefore we can start to think about well uh, how can we decenter humans right if you're if you have to deal with that stuff you're not going to think about decentering humans <laughs> yeah. 
So there's a there's a par- I mean, what I'm trying to get at is not that this this stuff is um, is uh, only about privilege, but there is a relationship here between or a tension between being in that kind of position and um, articulating a, what I would call a sort of um, articulating a position out of one's privilege, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, it's it, it's. I would argue that we need to be playful about this. <laughs> so I would I would say the book is quite playful, and even even though the introduction is quite strident, I was aiming for quite a playful tone in terms of what what can we sort of um, how can, how far can we move towards animals, mm. but also. Um, you know, it's it, it's about sort of how how much discomfort I think, or how much unease we're prepared to take in a position of privilege. And if you're privileged, that you can probably take more, right? <laughs> so it, 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 it's a sort of a balancing act, I think. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean, I live in a small, grotty, Vic Wardian terrace, and uh, it's really interesting. This year, the the there's been a huge amount of mice. We've not, we've been in the house for over four years and mm-hmm. we've never had, we've had some mice. So we bought a cat, um, uh, a black cat. And uh, with the, with the customary 10 white hairs on her chest, no, no black cat ever seems to be pure in my, my experience. And she kills like you wouldn't believe. Um, and there was this kind of funny moment because we didn't have her spade. So she had kittens and then, which meant she was going out at night and um, doing that stuff, which meant she was bringing fleas into the house. And she was bringing a lot of fleas into the house because the moggies that she was mating with were, anyway, it got too much. So we spayed her, but one of our big concerns about spaying her was that it would denature her so that she wouldn't have the inclination to kill the mice. So it was like we were making these selections about the type of animal that we were, (laughs) the type of beast we were willing to uh, uh, bring into our house, but this year the mice have gone completely off the off the off the gauge, and so she's killing about three a day. We barely have to feed her, um, which is great. But but it is a, it is a really interesting kind of um, like we can't stop nature coming into our house. This morning I was cooking porridge and I looked up and there was a bloody enormous snail on the ceiling of my kitchen. Um, so we can't we can't we don't have the kind of position. For some reason, because we've got leaky doors and windows, uh, to, to kind of stop nature in that kind of way. Um, but I was thinking that there, there is this kind of the, the book is, as you say, it is a very joyful book. It's not a it's not a diatribe, it's not a kind of um it's not a kind of too didactic or anything like that, but it is, but it does take a critical perspective to to a specific condition, which is this condition of um accelerating modernization where cities because so you talked about Lamas at the be- beginning and you were talking about a building and that's the the scale at which say for example architecture students and even architects largely operate at is that the scale of the building but really the build, the book is to me about the urban scale the relationship of the modern urban realm and the modern urban mindset to nature it's like so we we talk about it, we we reflect upon it, we illustrate it by buildings, but really what we're talking about is this huge behemoth creature, this Anthropocene as some have it, which is about industrial modernity, post-industrial modernity, whatever, and nature's relationship to that. And that's a much more complicated thing, isn't it? The city itself has become a kind of um, anemic um, and and uh, unnatural environment. And that's a very old story. That's a, That's as old as cities themselves it is old but the question of scale is new is a new one and uh, and and you know i do i do keep you know i don't necessarily think statistics tell us a huge amount but i do keep coming back to this statistic that you know the built environment is 40 percent and increasing of global global co2 emissions Mm. you know and, and architects obviously don't contribute a huge amount to that Personally, they only design a very, very tiny amount of that environment. But nevertheless, it's still buildings, right? It's still construction. It's still what I would classify as a non-architect, as architecture. Right? Mm-hmm. It's, 
it's it's everything that's built yeah and a really you know startling statistic is that there's more of that stuff now than there is of of organic material and and likely to be um two thirds of the planet in in another twenty or thirty years at the rate we're going and and I think this question of this tipping of the balance is a is a is is unprecedented right and and you know nineteen hundred three percent of the world was was human created and, and now it's over fifty percent and to me that is a it's not a um it's not something that can, really can be or or easily assimilated into any kind of pre-existing ideas about because mm. of the scale of it and I think every single architecture student knows this now they come into architecture school you know I see this every every year with this weight on their shoulders of this 40 percent we have to change we have to do something different and I think my feeling is that that is um on the one hand extremely encouraging to see mm. that students are embracing it but on, the, but on the other hand it's it's a big weight <laughs> yeah it's like yeah. a and actually uh you know bearing the responsibility like that can be really unhelpful yeah certainly what i've noticed in a lot of the projects this year and certainly in the in the last few years is is a lack of humor right <laughs> I don't know oh, yeah. when you notice this, Ambrose. This is deadly serious approach, and I, I, I'm, I'm kind of keen to shift that a little bit and say, well, perhaps being playful is is a more appropriate response to heavy responsibility, mm. or it can be, it can be, because it, um, because it's slightly. It, it opens up, I think, um, the possibility of a kind of creative response mm. rather than this kind of um, heaviness, which is often about, um, it gets us back to kind of solving problems, instrumentality, the idea that we have to do something useful for this massive problem that's mm. looming over us. But neither would I be fatalistic and say, well, there's nothing we, we can do. You know, I would say, well, perhaps the the sense is that we could be a bit more playful with this and a bit more um uh less feel less burdened by it mm. yeah for sure because there's this there, there's these two st- i mean i want to ask you one of the question i want to ask you is which was your favorite animal in the book but the other question it seems to me to be that there's this tension between one description of this um this animal architecture which is that we're doing a bad job and we need to embrace animals and bring them in on the other hand there's this other side which says the encroachment produces a form of anxiety Um, and it's even in written into those ideas about those post-apocalyptic scenes where you see the reindeer you know like i am legend or films like that where where there's where there's um that encroachment is at once beautiful and a sign of hope, but also a sign of despair and disaster. It's the sign of the end of everything, but also potentially the green shoots of something new. So I'm kind of interested in those two things. But what you seem to be doing is kind of walking a line between the two and saying, and you say in the coda, you say in the final section of the book, coda uh, chapter, I suppose, um, you say, living alongside, and in this case, you say aquatic animals, It's not merely about respecting their intelligence, but rather about developing an awareness of their radical difference to us, which I think is really interesting. And that, to me, gets to the heart of this idea of the creative possibilities here. Is that what we seem to be doing? And because of our our principal engagement with animals is through either ones that have been raised in sheds that we eat or through domestic pets. Um, is that we have this tendency to 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 assimilate them into a, what's what's the word um, anthropomorphize them, yeah, and that actually if we're to be creative about this, we need to maintain their difference, yeah, understand their difference. Yeah, I, I, I this is this is, I mean, it's this is very central, and it's it's kind of why this rather 
for, for some anyway, with rather strange philosophy called object oriented ontology is something I use in the introduction. And I did think quite long and hard about whether to use something else, which was perhaps a little bit more approachable. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's the right philosophy, actually. Yeah. Thinking about it, you know. Do you want to more... explain it a bit? I mean, other than it sounding like something that Liza Doolittle is made to say to improve her diction. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I have issues with it, but let's, let's, so, you know, um, so it maintains that, you know, really in the history of Western thought, and particularly Western philosophy, a particular kind of thinking has dominated called correlationism. And that is that actually the world only means something when it correlates to us. Mm -hmm. And that really comes from Kant originally and Kant's, you know, 18th century key kind of philosopher for modernity, basically. Um, and what I found interesting is that, you know, common sense tells us that that's completely stupid <laughs> and absurd of course things exist without us there on the scene right you know mm -hmm. a tree is a tree whether we're there or not or a um I, okay i've been looking at plants so plants are on my my mind but uh, animals right they're they're there whether we're there or not but actually this if we if we accept that it creates a really very deep philosophical problem because it means that if things exist unto themselves, right, this is ontology, the yeah. act of existing of being, therefore they are intractably different and alien from us. Right? We can't know them fully. We can't ever know them fully if we maintain that they do have an existence unto themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it, Heidegger is also a key philosopher of the 20th century who really tries to deal with this question of be being and what being means. But if we accept that, you know, a, um, a tree, a dog, an iPhone, whatever we say, a table, exists independently of us, then we have to accept or account for the fact that we can't know that thing exhaustively. And that's very, very tricky because mm -hmm. particularly in something like modern science, modern science really generally I think until recently anyway, would assert that we can know things exhaustively. We can, but we have to adopt this certain standpoint, objective standpoint, scientific standpoint. But we, but eventually we can know the thing exhaustively. And certainly I would argue very strongly against that, that the intractable kind of singularity of things existing independently of us is something which we should try and grapple with. We, 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 an object-oriented ontology is an attempt to do that. And what it does is it, it, it actually ends up giving more emphasis to what we would call creative, artistic, aesthetic responses to the world, precisely because the aesthetic response for this particular type of philosophy represents a more um, a potentially richer way of describing the world without this assertion that we, we can know it exhaustively, objectively, et cetera, et cetera, that science does. It's not kind of dismissing science, but it's dismissing that claim of science yeah, as a, an exhaustive form of knowledge, a privileged form of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I would see it, see it as a kind of shifting rebalancing of humans position in the world particularly their position of how they know the world mm. as the most valuable thing that object oriented ontology contributes it's got its problems in terms of uh, what about politics what about ethics you know in terms of like the human is so decentered that it seems to be lost in this massive field of almost infinite kind of other things existing Mm -hmm. supposedly on the same kind of level the same uh certainly a non-hierarchical form of um existence mm -hmm. does create massive problems in terms of what, what, what do we say about the world how can we know the world in that kind of situation but i find it tremendously liberating so it ties in i think it ties in very closely with an anarchist idea of the world right where anarchism is fundamentally about asserting this the, the equality of 
other humans, right, in a political system. But if we extend that to, to things outside of the human, we get a very sort of anarchist idea of existence, of ontology, mm. which I think is very, for me, is very exciting, very liberating. It's also very overwhelming, <laughs> to, yeah. put it, to put it lightly. Um, but, but, it, but it's a definitive shift away from, in terms of architecture, from kind of, well, it's a it's a it's a shift on from the postmodern ideas, isn't it? If postmodernity is modernity plus some context, but really at the heart of it, maintaining the privileging of modernist empirical enlightenment thinking, and that's probably not fair, but <laughs> excuse me, something along those lines. This is a kind of deepening that deepening that contextualization that potential for contextualization of architecture so so we could in this case not just make our architectures um responsive to social cultural political realities on the site but but also the animals the nature yeah. that exists within it yeah the animals the plants the fungi the mm -hmm protozoa the viruses right where do we stop yeah and that's why you know when 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 you are faced with this 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 expanded field is 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 not quite the right <laughs> the right no no way. It's it's that's enough. why we need to be playful because it's it's absolutely overwhelming and it and it and, it, and the overwhelmingness is is a necessary starting point mm and being playful, I think, is the most probably the most appropriate response to that sense of suddenly the whole thing exploding. It's an, I'm just going to sound quite critical, but it's an easy word. But how does one do playful architecture? I mean, without going down that kind of <laughs> ironic, postmodern Michael Graves. Uh, and okay. Ross is. There's, there's, um. There's a couple of really interesting examples in the book. So, um, firstly, let, let's think about beavers. So, beavers are interesting. Probably the the most, you know, uh, outside of humans, the the, the 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 life form that changes the environment the most. I mean, it's not it's not comparable really, but certainly they do change the landscape mm -hmm. in terms of creating areas of wetland. Yeah. very significantly and now it's being seen as useful to humans because we can mitigate climate change the effects of climate change by allowing beavers to change the landscape there's a really interesting illustration in the book i don't know if you remember it of um this figure called um oh gosh i can't remember let me have a look gray owl so gray owl is a uh he's a pretended to be uh, an indigenous um, Indian American, how we, uh, in, the, in the early part of the 20th century, mm -hmm. he was actually British. <laughs> he, he dressed up, pretended, right? And this is very problematic, a complete colonization of knowledge, but he, he, he became fascinated with beavers and he actually lived and observed beavers and was subject of a few films in the 1920s and 30s. And there's an image still from one of those films showing him li living in a log cabin and a beaver actually building its um, lodge right next to him in the mm -hmm. same room. And for me, that is a leaving aside all of the problems, <laughs> the very sort of nature of that allowance, that kind of cohabitation, I find really exciting mm. because it, it is very playful. Yes, it's incredibly disruptive. Yes, it's it's an unholy mess is created. But it's also creates this incredible sense of liberation of um, what we regard as the function of architecture, right? At a very basic kind of level. But also the sense of... Um, Inhabitation is 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 suddenly kind of magnified, and and for me, I'd emphasise the fact that that's very playful. It's something which is creating joy and creativity, 
in addition to to mess. So it, it kind of it it to me it it holds within it something very exciting. Mm-hmm. The other example is um, comes out of the work of Jeff Manor, who, who I keep coming back to Jeff Manor's um, building blog, which is now quite old, but it, it c- continues to resonate with me because of his his very playful approach. Uh, and I think he, for me, enca- he encapsulates something about like how we can sort of have more fun with this mm. and at the same time say something really, really profound and serious and radical. You know, that His work is very radical in terms of what it's suggesting. Um, but he worked with an artist, uh, architect, artist, architect, John um, Becker, to propose a, a sort of genetic manipulation of bees so that they actually... Um, called concrete bees, that they, um, instead of produce, you know, they produce concrete, which allows them to go about the world and, and lay down their concrete on structures. He was, his idea of a living 3D printer. Yeah. yeah. Which uh, essentially is kind of what certain social insects are. Mm-hmm. Silkworm is not in my book, but it, I do quote it. The silkworm is a really good example of a, you might call a living 3D printer. Yeah. Silk is emitted by the animal and we use it, spiders as well. Uh, you know, it can be used and we, we you know, we steal it to, to make textiles out of. So he imagined this, you know, genetically modified bee going around and creating architectural ornament. Mm. You know, this, this, uh, initially repairing, you know, created to repair stone without human labour. But they 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 go feral and start to make their own ornaments, you know. And I think thinking in this way, in a kind of slightly, well, in this case, a kind of science fiction scenario, allows us, you know, a definite sense of creative playfulness coming yeah. in, For and sure. it gets us away from this very quite dour, serious approach to environmental kind of um, concerns in architecture. Which I, I I find very exciting and and, and innovating, energizing. Yeah, much more likely to persuade. I think that's. I was talking to Susanna Hagen about her book about architecture in the Anthropocene, and one of the things that she points is it called Architecture in the Anthropocene? Hold on, I better get that right. Um, is it the revolution? Oh yeah, revolution. Eh? Yeah. Um, Oh and, there's, and she makes this point, which I think is very good, which is that e- an ecological architecture has never communicated the um, same level of excitement that modernism did. Mm-hmm. The modernism was just extraordinarily exciting. And the, uh, the modern city is an extraordinarily exciting place. And, and the, instead, what we have in the kind of ecological movement is a kind of, not universally, but very frequently a sense that A, we're guilty, B, we should feel ashamed, and C, we should stop it. (laughs) (laughs) And then then make an architecture that kind of corrects you. It's sort of like being spanked, Um, (laughs) which which would be, uh, yeah, which is a thing. Um, uh, But but I think that perhaps this playfulness and this interactivity with animals um, as a route into a playfulness is is a really lovely idea. I mean, obviously, as you said before we started recording, you are sat here now, you have your dog next to you. So you have a natural kind of inclination towards a playfulness with animals. I'm a cat owner. Now, cats couldn't... But but, but Ambrose, that goes both ways. And for me, this is... I don't play with my dog because I want to play with my dog. I play with my dog because the dog wants to play. Yeah. Right? This is not something which I'm instigating. And I think there's something really extraordinary about what you learn from pets. Mm. Pets have normally been considered to be not re- not quite real animals, right? They're... Mm. <laughs> because they're human. What kind of dog have you got? He's a cavapoo. So he's a cross between a King Charles Cavalier and a poodle. And... Uh, he is a completely neurotic dog. He's the most neurotic animal I've ever in, encountered. But he's also very, he's, he's very, he's very lovely. So my, my, you know, my day to day, most days are dictated by his needs as much as my own. Yeah. And I think, you know, if, if you think about that, you know, if we extend that to other animals, that's quite, yeah. 
we are capable of doing it, right? Yeah. We are capable of making quite big sacrifices yeah. for certain animals. So, you know, it's, it's not that humans don't do it and humans aren't doing it all the time. But we get a lot back, right? So that's the key. You know, we 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 have pets, and what, what I find interesting is if you talk to people who have unusual pets, like rats or snakes or mm-hmm. spiders, they say the same thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we are we are quite incredulous that a spider might communicate, right? But the very act of um, living with another animal creates communication Mm -hmm. and i think that's a really key issue here is that we have to allow we have to sort of allow cohabitation to get the benefits of it Mm -hmm. and and for me that's key is that it's not about utility it's not about providing stuff for animals so they can survive i mean it's partly that right i'm not against that the first, you know, the Aqua Tower in, in, in Chicago is the example that I begin the book with. But we, we, we could do a lot better than just not killing things. <laughs> yes. But it's not, it's not about instrumentalizing. It's not about kind of solving the problem of how to keep animals alive. It's about engaging and it's about entangling ourselves with them mm-hmm. so that we can benefit. And we benefit because they give us something back. Do you think the reason why we don't do this, because, I mean, so I used to, when I was a kid, I used to go and stay on this, um, for for some weeks in each summer, we'd go and stay on this distributist farm in Northamptonshire, and they lived cheek by jowl with their, um, with, with their animals. I mean, they knew them by name, they petted them, and they ate them. Um, and it was a very, and we would sleep, we would sleep in the fields with the cows and in the morning. We would wake up and all the cows, we would just sleep on the floor in, in sleeping bags and the cows would all be around us. And mainly probably because we slept under the hawthorn trees and then the cows all gathered around the hawthorn trees because that's what they do in the in the shade. Um, but anyway, and also because we admitted probably a huge amount of methane, so they felt quite happy in our company. But but there, yeah, and, and so this idea of... Um, this idea of this playfulness, I think, is something to do with childhood as well, isn't it? It's like there's some kind of aspect of our modernity that has become far too, far too serious. And that actually a natural relationship to animals is one of wonder. It is like you say, you know, you describe your dog as neurotic, which is kind of hilarious, really, but it's probably true as well i mean it's not just your interpretation of the dog it's that you know in 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 owning your dog the world the mind of the animal is vaguely accessible to your interpretation so it creates this sense of wonder yeah and um you know i guess the the question of what is the value of anthropomorphic Mm -hmm. thinking is also big big question that i think comes out of this book but also everything i've done since then really um and and there's a wonderful quote in jane bennett's book vibrant matter which i would encourage everybody to read really because it's such a key key text on decentering the human and it's quite early it's 2011 i think she, she published it um he said, perhaps we need a bit more anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism to, to counteract anthropocentrism. Yeah. <laughs> By which she means, why are we so worried mm. about uh, things like, um, you know, this vagueness, that's a romanticism, superstition, animism. Why are we so worried about this and not worried about maintaining this this objective distance right mm. that we think we have to do yeah you know, one, one of the worst things you can do as an academic is to um is to kind of go all mystical right it it's seen as a career killer <laughs> i don't know whether that's still the case actually <laughs> 
Well, but there's that, certain faith systems like Marxism that you're still allowed to ascribe to, but like the rest of them, not 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 even slightly. Um, or you at least have to hold. I think I think you have to hold it in, in in certainly any form of spiritualism. You have to hold in. You have to sneer at it essentially, but because I think that is the thing that's at stake here, isn't it? Is that 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 privileging of a certain form? And you mentioned science earlier, but maybe we could call it scientism. Yeah, that privileging of that kind of knowledge is it doesn't seem to be very robust. And that so, so the possibility of encountering and engaging with animals in a way that is that goes beyond biological evolutionary biological thinking seems to be absolutely haram. Like you can't do it because you make a fool of yourself and then no one takes you seriously. So you've, we've all we're all walking this line of, of, of declaring our allegiance to a reality that as you as a dog owner, me as a cat owner that we're actually aware isn't very it seems to be counteractive by our experience of the world which i find really interesting so my my one of my brothers is a, keeps bees it's a remarkable relationship they're a domesticated insect yeah um and he i, I like he w- when they come out early when his bees come out early in the year when the sun is warm but the shadow is cold and the bees spend too long in the shadow, they cool down and they sink to the ground. They can't carry on flying. They run out of energy. Mm. So he picks them up and blows on them <laughs> until they're warm enough to fly off again. So it's, a, it's actually, a, but, but at the same time, they're an insect, but they, they only operate kind of as a collective of 25,000 kind of things. So it's a really, weird, really weird. So we know that there's this kind of relationship. Or I saw a woman on a horse and a giant creature, you know, massive fucking creature. And she sat on the back of it and it was a bit aggressive. And she said, stop it. And it did. And I couldn't believe it. It was like it could trample her in about two seconds. And so so we actually intuit a natural symbiosis, a natural relationship and, and a deeper perceptual field to the world. But science, scientific thinking doesn't really permit of that. Yes, and well, architecture, yeah. architecture as a kind of serious discipline, in inverted commas, s- s- is going to struggle with that as a consequence. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it, it, it struggles with it in, in the way that it is approaching these kinds of questions now, which it is readily approaching these mm-hmm. kinds of questions, I guess, uh, en masse in terms of architecture, at least what I see where I teach at the Bartlett. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, you know, problem in terms of the bigger, right, the bigger structures of knowledge, yeah. which aren't necessarily being being questioned. Part of this is time and, and the, the kind of relentless pace of education uh that, that you need you need to open up space spaces large enough to do this mm-hmm. um and that's that's a problem because I, I did start teaching this subject last year and and, and i'm struggling now to, to sort of work out how i can do that in the sh- short amount of time that i'm allotted to you know to teach it do you teach it as design or as theory as theory mm-hmm. uh, but this, this, you know, students are masters level architecture students, so they, they, they're coming very much from position of going into the profession. Um, but the, the bar is, is is unusual in in kind of not necessarily emphasising that so much. Um, but certainly, these this kind of notion of um, There are philosophical traditions, right? So there are philosophical traditions that we can draw on. Phenomenology is one, and that had it a big moment in the 1990s in, mm-hmm. in architectural schools. If you remember, <laughs> I do. I do. In fact, I'm. I'm in fact, I'm going to be speaking to um, Yohani Palasma um, ah. about the eyes of the skin and other of his work at some point. But he's also written about animals as well. So um, I'd be fascinated to know what. What he what he says what that would be that'd be a wonderful conversation I'm sure <laughs> but phenomenology is definitely um there to be revisited I think it's very centered but it, it it definitely is 
the key philosophical moment of challenging the scientific kind of emphasis on um, objectivity. Mm. So it, it it it's very it's very important in terms mm. of uh, getting getting hold of a tradition of of thinking. I, I would say. Yeah. Um, I guess one of the key things that I I have said, you know, and I I, I my position is I'm not an architect. So it gives it definitely gives me a lot of freedom to sort of say things that probably wouldn't architects perhaps would struggle with a bit. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, this question of not building and staying longer in this place of speculation, imagination, I would see as really key because we have amazing tools now <laughs> to do that, mm. and certainly, I think it can be used as a way of kind of rebalancing or sort of de-emphasizing utility, which they, I don't think there's any harm in that. You know, I, I, you know, to not be able to hold off, to open up space, that can be done in a very creative way. And, and, and you know, I think it's, it's to me, it's, it's eminently possible to do that. For sure, for sure. That's a good point to finish on. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. I really enjoyed that. Me too. Thank you, Ambrose. As you, great pleasure. Free your mind indeed. Wild. Thanks to Paul for taking the time to speak with me and to reaction for the book. See the podcast description for links, as normal, and go buy the book. Paul was recently on Radio 4, speaking about OMA's Aviva Studios. Listen to that too, and follow him on Instagram, X, and via his website. Thanks for listening.